This episode is brought to you by DBud. As a musician and podcaster, protecting my hearing is crucial to what I do. DBud are the best earplugs I have ever come across. They are volume adjustable, which is crucial when you're making music, and they're incredibly effective at filtering noise at the right level, giving you the hearing protection you need whilst retaining the clarity of the sound you're exposed to. Honestly, in the past, I've really struggled with earplugs, and DBud make a product that is pretty much the first that I can actually tolerate and use when I'm recording podcasts, when I'm making music, uh, even when I need to filter out noise when I'm sleeping. It can be quite noisy in this house during lockdown. So honestly, a huge recommendation for everybody listening to this. Go to earlabs.co and check out DBud's volume adjustable earplugs. They're amazing. It's obviously not part of my... Um... Uh, work so to speak but it is an important part of my because I do listen to music uh, a lot um, not as much as I would like to perhaps but I still do uh, I, st I go to concerts quite regularly as well although again obviously with the current goings on I haven't been able to do that in fact the last one I went to was an Iron Maiden concert just over a year and a bit ago so I uh, yes I do have a and it does play quite an important part of my life in terms of relaxation also interest um, since I discovered Spotify, I've discovered all kinds of new music that I'd never known about before. Yeah, Spotify is very good for the consumer. I think it's, um, yeah. you know, it's difficult to criticize it with regards to how good it is for the consumer. You know, you can listen to anything that you want for 10 quid a month. It's only only for the artists who aren't getting paid a lot. Um, I mean, it's yes. mainly COVID, isn't it? Um, I suppose artists can make decent money through touring in normal circumstances so hopefully we can get back to that yeah. asap yeah indeed i mean I, you, you're interested i gather in what i think about the music business and uh, i have to say that i'm not quite as bearish about the way the music business is going as many people are i know that it's very annoying if you're a successful you know musician or songwriter that lots of people can effectively get your your creations for free uh, but I think in some ways that's always inevitably been a part of music. Uh, it's, it's, I'm not myself a fan of the idea of intellectual property, I should make that clear. And I think, as you say, the, the, the way to make money if you're a decent musician really in the contemporary world is through merchandising and touring. Uh, and there are people like, say, Madonna, who you know, made a whole living out of that. She doesn't have a music contract anymore. Uh, the people, I think, who are really losing out uh, and are frantically trying to use media like Spotify and platforms like it to retain control of the other music companies, the distributors who used to, quite frankly, you know, rip off musicians to an extraordinary degree. Uh, I remember once hearing uh, Roger Daltrey being interviewed on the radio, and he was telling this rather funny story about how in the early days, the Who would have meetings with their accountants and they'd be told how they were selling millions of albums and making a ton of money, but it was all going in royalty fees to the music company and they were actually broke. Uh, <laughs> which is one reason why they decided to smash up their instruments on the stage because they thought, well, we might as well do this, you know, uh, uh, what's there to lose? So uh, I think in many ways, the developments, it's, it's hard because it's adjustment, but I think in many ways the developments we're seeing are good. COVID obviously is a huge blow. If you're, a, uh, you know, if you're in any aspect of the performing arts at the moment, you're being screwed majorly, but hopefully that, that won't last too much longer. Yeah, I think that that's very insightful. And it's, you know, it's not just musicians or people in creative arts, obviously hospitality. It's, it's loads yeah. of people in industries where there is a viable way to make money in normal circumstances yeah but you know the, this is this is the situation now but so so you're not you're not as bearish as as some some others about the way that the music um industry has has gone no no i'm, I'm not really i mean i i think it's the same with publishing actually and, and writing i write quite regularly for uh you know for various outlets uh, commercially as well as academically and I think a lot of artists and writers are hung up on the idea that if you don't have copyright and enforceable, you can't make a, a living. Uh, and that's clearly untrue. I mean, William Shakespeare didn't have any problems making a, a pretty successful living. and There was no copyright in his time. Mm -hmm. uh, when Giuseppe Verdi wrote uh, La Donna Immobile for Rigoletto, he knew he had a fantastic tune in his hands. Didn't teach the lead tenor how to sing it until like two nights before the main 
uh, you know, performance, the initial performance. And the reason why I did that was because he knew that within like a couple of days of the first performance, the, the tune would have been circulated everywhere and every bugger under the sun would be uh, using it. So the, the, it's actually quite unusual to be able to extract as much fees out of users of your music as people were able to do in the middle decades of the 20th century. But that didn't stop musicians and composers making a fair amount of money. And there's an advantage to being the recognised originator of a piece of music, as you know, the case of Verdi himself, for example, shows, you know, a very successful composer, very, uh, you know, well rewarded in his career, despite the fact that he, you know, he created, I think, two of the 10 most recognised tunes on the planet. And you mentioned there with regards to being a writer, you know, people getting hung up on, on the concept of, of, of copyright. How does it work there? What, why isn't it that important? Well, um, context? the thing is this, you see, people, what most people don't realise is that there are two things to points to make here. The first is that most writers do not have copyright in their own product. Uh, the copyright typically is held by the publisher. Now, the reason for that is that until very recently, um, in the in the kind of modern world, you had to have a publisher to store and distribute the hard copy of your or whatever it is. It was the publisher who got virtually nine. Uh, the exceptions to that are the very small number of people who are major major bestsellers. Now, uh, people confuse copyright with being identified and acknowledged as the author of the text. That's something completely different. If somebody takes your work and says, presents it as being their own work, that's actually a fraud. That's not a breach of copyright. The breach of copyright is taking what you've written and reproducing it and selling it on. Now, if you're a successful author, uh, then you can make money simply by being the first uh, you know, the, the author, people will actually be prepared to pay. Uh, you maybe make, may not make as much, but that brings me to the second point, which is that actually, historically, the great majority of authors do not uh, make a lot of money out of their work. Sadly, that's just the nature of the game. Um, it's one of those markets which has very pronounced winner-takes-all income distributions. So for every J.K. Rowling, who's, a, you know, nearly a billionaire these days, uh, mm -hmm. there are literally hundreds of thousands of authors who, you know, uh, maybe make a very small income or make no income at all. Uh, so actually, you don't lose that much if you're in a world without property. J.K. Rowling would lose out, undoubtedly. Uh, she would not be making the megabucks that she's making, but she's still making a decent living. And and what do you think is the difference in these superstar markets? Because obviously music is a, another example of yeah. the type of market where only a select few do incredibly well and then everybody else struggles. What is it, do you think, that's the X factor that, that determines your success? Um, it's, it's a combination of two things, innate talent and luck, basically. Um, the innate talent and the hard work and application um, is a necessary condition. You're not going to be one of the mega stars who make the big bucks unless you have it. But after that, in many ways, it's just fortune. It's just good luck. Uh, that's, that's the uh, common element. Um, Malcolm Gladwell, um, has a pretty good book about this where he explains how that how that works and is uh, that outliers or yes outliers yes that's what i've read that yeah yeah uh, and so it, it, it is really just a matter of you just have to be in the right place at the right time where you have to hit some you know you produce a particular kind of music or a particular kind of writing or maybe film because this also applies in the media business more generally film stars are exactly the same uh, which just happens to catch the zeitgeist and a lot of people like it and you're going to win the bucks and it's once it's started it tends to be self-sustaining so because you're making a lot of money you tend to have a high profile which means that people know about you which means they buy your books listen to your music uh, you know watch the films that you're in that kind of thing and so for a while at any rate not forever but for a while it's a kind of self-sustaining process um, the other thing which, the, there are quite a number of art, labour markets where you find this winner takes all um, kind of structure. Professional sports and entertainment is another one. And one of the other things is that, as well as those two qualities I mentioned, there are some people who have a kind of indefinable other quality. In competitive sport, what you find is that as well as people who are very, very talented and fortunate, there are some people who simply make a difference. They, they, they are that very small number of select 
athletes or football players, whatever it is, who really do make a difference to the team they play for. And mm. so it's worth paying a huge amount of money to get them. The trouble is you don't know who they are until somebody has found them, by which point they become incredibly expensive. Uh, and the same is true in financial services, it's true in law, and to some extent it's true in things like writing and music as well. You just find that some people, um, as well as being discovered, they just have a certain something about them, you know, a creativity maybe, or uh, a kind of individual quality that is, is very hard to describe, but you, you know it when you see it. Yeah, it's it's that type of personality that just kind of shines through and is yeah, precisely totally unique. Do you think that, you know, you mentioned innate talent being one of the prerequisites to success in creative industries. Do you think to a certain extent, I mean, I guess you kind of answered it there, um, being known, literally just getting your name out there, is that more important than, than innate talent? I uh, mean, no, <laughs> no, I I'll, I'll, I'll answer that directly. Um, being simply being famous for being famous which is the kind of thing you're talking about mm. you know being well known just because you're on youtube a lot or you've been on some reality tv show that may get you success and income for a short time but if you don't have the talent it ain't gonna last that, it's as simple as that um i remember once hearing paul mccartney saying that anyone who's been successful in popular music for more than about 18 months to two years has got to have talent because if you don't you will be found out. You'll be a one-hit wonder, maybe a two-hit wonder, and you'll you'll vanish like snow off a dike, as they say in Scotland. Uh, so I think that no, simply being well known may get you a brief flash, like a meteor in the dark night sky, but it's not going to get you long-lasting reward. Do you mean that in an artistic sense, or in or in general? Because I mean, there are oh. some people who seem to be uh, very famous for being very, very famous, and they remain well, very, I don't very mean, famous. Well, I mean, the kind of very, Paris very Hilton's of this world, or dare I say, the Donald Trump's, but... Um, ah, yes, yes indeed. Uh, the, yeah, the, there is a certain... The Kim Kardashian's? I mean, what yeah, is Kim indeed, Kardashian? Indeed, another kind of thing. Well, what I would say to that is that actually, unfortunately, um, or maybe fortunately for them anyway, people like that do have a talent, which is a talent of knowing what will appeal to and work with the media, as it is at the moment. Um, and I suspect there's always been people like that throughout history. So the rest of us may think this is a rather annoying talent or maybe one that shouldn't command the rewards that it does, but it is a talent, undoubtedly. I mean, I think you could say, for example, I mean, I mentioned Donald Trump. So now that he's no longer with us on the medium of Twitter, I think you can say he, he's, he was a genius at using that particular medium. He knew how to use it in a way that attracted a lot of attention, made him the focus of a lot of attention, which he loves, of course, but which also brought a lot of income and hits into the platform, which is why, you know, they, they took so long to do anything like banning him until he'd incited a rebellion, basically. Yeah, so, I mean, Twitter have almost, they've waited to a very opportune moment for them. I mean, looking at it quite cynically, you know, they've waited till Biden's about to come in and Biden and his administration are probably going to be very pleased about Trump being kicked off Twitter as indeed are, are many people around the world. Um, but, you know, they've got that. Um, and also, you know, they've, they've kind of increased like something like a, over a quarter or a third of all Twitter users followed Trump. Yeah. Um, which is ridiculous. Um, so, so, you know, he's, he's been a great kind of, influencer for them with his with his use of twitter uh the question that uh i guess is on a lot of people's minds with with all of this who a lot of the you know 70 million people who voted for him um people tend to exaggerate the amount of people that voted for donald trump i've noticed on the uh, republican right uh, side they, they kind of exaggerate i heard someone claiming that he'd got 80 million votes but that's, that's right no that's the that's, 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 the, that's the number that biden got um, yeah, no, I know. Yeah, but um, but but anyway, uh, you know, without Twitter and with you know, it's he's literally been kicked off every single platform. Of the, he's been mm. kicked off even Shopify. Um, is this really it for 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 Trump? You know, he's been kicked off Pinterest and Snapchat. I mean, I didn't even know he used. Them. I didn't know that. <laughs> I didn't know he used them. He's literally, you know, if Trump queued outside at queued outside, you know, when the club when the clubs reopen. Um, 
in, uh, you know, it hopefully one day, a post coronavirus, if he queued outside sort of Poonanar on Park Street in Bristol, I don't know whether he'd get let in. Um, <laughs> so, so is, is this really, do you think this is going to be it for him? Is he going to end up in jail or something like that? Well, I, well, I hope so. Uh, I think he may well end up in jail, actually. I mean, it's an interesting question about what will happen. Um, currently, as you know, the House of Representatives has passed articles of impeachment against him, making him, you know, the first president to be impeached twice. He'll probably boast about it. And uh, the, the question is, can the, there's 50, going to be 50 Democratic senators in the Senate. To convict, you need a two-thirds majority, supermajority. So there has to be 17 Republican senators who will vote to convict him. I suspect I would give you even money, or slightly better than even money, that you will get that. Uh, because it's actually in the self-interest of the Republican Party to do this, simply because it will stop him running for office again. And the, the thinking, I think, of people like Mitch McConnell and some of the other leaders in the Senate on the Republican side, which is deeply cynical, I have to say, uh, mm. nothing public spirited or principled about this, whatever, is profoundly cynical, um, will be that uh, this serves their interest because it means that they can like put Trump behind him, try to hang on to his voters and go forward. Now, I have to say, I don't think that's gonna work because he's built up or created a kind of cult as the sort of expressions you described just um, just mentioned. Um, so I, I'm not sure that it's going to work out quite as um, people like Mitch McConnell think it is. It's, it's going to be all kinds of ructions going forward, in my view. As for what will happen mm. to Donald Trump once he leaves office, I think he probably will face criminal charges. Uh, you now, you know, who knows how that will work out? The way the US criminal justice system works, you know, makes it, I would say, again, an even money better as to whether or not he actually will end up doing time. I suspect he probably won't actually. Uh, but on the other hand, he could well face bankruptcy. Now, is he going to be denied a media platform? Um, there's a lot of loose talk about censorship at the moment, because I say loose talk because this isn't censorship. Uh, organizations like Twitter and Facebook are private companies. They have every right to block a user if they want to. I can't go up to a private company and demand that they you know, give me a platform or publish me. That's not the way it works. But on the other hand, at the moment, they have quasi monopolies because they, they're totally dominant in that market. Now, uh, there's no technological reason why you can't set up a rival. Um, and that's what I think some people might think about doing now. Uh, Although the, their rival, people. their rival, um, which, you know, seems kind of oh. em embarrassingly, uh, yeah, I mean, it's an early stage company, but it's not, Parler, you mean. It's, yeah, Parler, it's not been kind of developed very well. And it's got this reputation of being full of kind of far right, um, white supremacist, yeah. extremist types. So, I mean, isn't whatever, whatever they would try to do on the Trump side, you know, to create some kind of Trump social network, I mean, they're not going to do that. And if they do, it will just well, be very cult it will turn into a real cult thing. I mean, it is kind of worrying, though, that you, in terms of polarization of society, that you take a whole raft of people and turn Trump into a martyr by kicking him off the platform, turning him into a martyr for, for his cult. It's, yes, it's, indeed. But I, th I think that's not the point. Um, it's true that it will do that. Uh, but unfortunately, I think things have gone too far in a way to uh, stop at this point now. Um, you simply have to send a signal that the kind of conduct he engaged in since November is simply not acceptable because refusing to accept the result of a democratic election conducted according to the law and procedure, uh, which has been demonstrated by you know more than 50 cases tried by judges, most of whom Trump himself appointed to have been completely baseless, these accusations of electoral fraud and the like, uh, and then actually inciting a, a mob to break into the legislature to disrupt the process of the uh, peaceful transfer of power. That is just beyond the pale. You can't let mm. that pass. Uh, you have to do something. Now, if it makes him a martyr, then that just shows you that, you know, things are in bad shape in terms of public opinion in the United States. But you certainly can't avoid it because that would send an even no. worse signal which is that you can get away with this kind of egregious misconduct and not suffer any kind of penalty. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, they've definitely sent a signal and I can see that it's, um, 
you know, there's, there is no other option. Something has to be done about it and something, yep. um, you know, extremely almost controversial in a way, like kicking them off the thing because, you know, they've had all this free speech debate. But as you say, these are, these are private companies and, you know, there's nothing really that you can legitimately complain about, even if you're a huge Trump supporter. However, uh, one thing that is that you pointed out before that is quite interesting is the extent to which um, these guys have a monopoly. You know, no, no one in their right mind is going to use Parler. That um, you know, very few people uh, in, in sort of normal circles of people, no one's got a Parler account. Yeah, right. So it's it's not like they were the competition, but it is just interesting how you know, Parler kind of got taken down off all these app stores and then booted off the Amazon um, servers. And, you know, they were completely decimated by the the, the big yeah. tech uh, giants. So it's, um, you know, does it matter that these guys have such a monopoly for society? And do you think that there, there will come a time? I remember having someone on the podcast before the election saying that Facebook would probably end up being broken up because, of course, they own WhatsApp, they own Instagram and their own Facebook. Yes, indeed. Um, well, um, I think that there is a problem with social media and the social media companies, which I include things like Google in as well, Alphabet, whatever they call themselves these days. But it, I don't think it's the problem that most people think it is, if you will. Um, I, I do think that the way a lot of these companies work is having a really bad effect, uh, but it's not to do with the fact that they're monopolies as such. Uh, um, if you have a monopoly, the question is, how easy is it for an alternative to be formed? Now, the argument is that with companies like um, Netflix, well, not so much Netflix, but certainly Facebook and Google, there's, they benefit from network effects, which means that the more people are on it, the more valuable it becomes. And so it actually becomes very hard for a rival to appear because it, the problem is that to become a serious rival, it's got to get to a certain level, critical mass of subscribers, people in its network. And until it gets there, nobody wants to be on it. Nobody in the right mind wants to be on it. Uh, however, I think that bar is perhaps a bit lower than many people realize. Now, the real problem I think with these companies and the kind of product that they produce, Facebook and the like, is related to their business model rather than the fact that they're being um, uh, monopolies or having a predominant position, is to do with the fact that basically um, the users are not the customers. The users are basically the product. Because what, as you probably know, what these companies are doing is harvesting our data and then selling it on to advertisers and marketing companies. Uh, and it's that business model that is, I think, at the root of a lot of the problems, because it's what creates really bad incentives for these uh, social networks to do things like, for example, having algorithms that are deliberately designed to keep the users in a state of constant agitation and wound upness, uh, very often by directing them to stuff that's going to make them mad as hell, because that captures your attention and it means that they get to harvest more of your data and find out more about what you like and what you don't like, which is very valuable for the um, advertisers. Mm. But that's because they're based on an advertising funding model. And that's a purely accidental event. It just happens that in the very early days of the internet, that was the model they chose on as a way of getting money because it wasn't clear how else you could charge. Now, I think now, I mentioned Netflix, and I think Netflix is different because it's based on a subscription model, um, as is Spotify, as are a number of other platforms. And I think that the way forward is actually not so much to break up Facebook, because then you just have like nine mini Facebooks all doing the same kind of bad stuff that Facebook is doing, which would not be an improvement, quite frankly. Um, what we should do is look to move the whole internet away from the advertising funding model to a subscription-based model. And I think this is actually happening. If you look at things like online sites for newspapers um, and things of that sort, a few years ago, only the Times had a paywall. Now, pretty much everywhere has a paywall. The Guardian is holding out, but it's, I think it is a holdout, really. And I don't mm. see that surviving. And I think that either voluntary or simply paywall-based subscriptions are the way that most people are going to go. Uh, and I think that the big networking sites um, it, uh, sooner or later, what's going to happen is somebody will create uh, a successful uh, subscription-based networking site, which people will join. 
and they will join it in preference to the quote free unquote sites like Facebook or Instagram uh, because um, it doesn't have the annoyance that comes with having uh, a site like that or Twitter or one of the other open ones. Uh, so I think that's the problem, not so much the monopoly, uh, because I actually think that that monopoly is not as strong as many people think. It's rather the business model of most of the social network, social media companies. Why would people go for a subscription-based model? Why would your average well, I mean, Joe do, do that? You've got it's, it's a question of, again, it goes to do the network effects. You will go for a subscription-based model if the um, number of people on it is sufficiently large or not, not necessarily large, but sufficiently valuable to you. It might be quite a small network, but it's all the people you need to know if you're in a certain line of business, for example. The model probably to follow would be LinkedIn's where you have a rudimentary basic service that you get for free, uh, again, free in quotes, but uh, there's a whole lot of other services that you need to pay a subscription to get. Now that's a highly successful networking site, uh, but it's not got the kind of enormous reach in terms of, you know, like every other person on the planet that say Instagram mm. or Facebook have. Uh, but I think what will, what the, the, the tech companies, I think will realize that um, if they don't go down this route, then they're going to be regulated as a public utility. And by the way, by booting Donald Trump off Twitter, have basically cut away one of their major defences because they always claimed that they're not a publisher, that they're yeah. basically a conduit. Like a dirty thing. Yeah, that's exactly. Yeah, they claim they're just like um, a, a telephone company. Well, they basically shot them completely, blown away their own defence there because. They're basically saying the reason why they boosted him off is because of the content and they're afraid of the effect it will have and the liability this will bring, which suggests that they're a publisher. So I think that essentially they're looking at some pretty extensive regulation. Um, yeah, going they're forward. on very shaky ground, it would seem to me, because they've they've kind of gone ahead and really compromised legacy media and um, driven legacy media's audience quite a lot um, downwards. Um, by being these kind of big open platforms. And now obviously they have a moral imperative to take Trump off and, and to start this whole thing of quote unquote censorship, um, which is their right, but then they enjoy these privileges. I'm, I'm, I mean, I'm not sure like what privilege exa exactly they enjoy under this kind of 230 thing. Um, well, what it means is that they are, um they're able to basically do what uh, is publication by any reasonable understanding of that term in the law without being subject to the same liabilities that publishers are. Because if you're a publisher, you are legally liable for the content uh, of the, the stuff that you put out. So you can be sued for libel, for example, um, and mm. certain, other, certain other kinds of legal liability that come with it, subject to all kinds of constraints, such as immediacy and the like, but they're excluded from that liability. So the, basically what it means is that although they are a publisher and defined as being like a publisher in many ways, uh, they are also uh, treated in terms of the sanctions that they can face for what they've, just, they've put out. They're treated much more like a telephone company, which, you know, is a pure conduit really yeah so quite I mean, recently you don't hold telephone companies liable for what people say in conversations across their lines yeah that would be ridiculous but at the same yeah it's a very difficult um situation for any government to to kind of step in and, and and regulate because i mean obviously they're not like a publisher like the times or something it's it would be yeah. like saying you know the times are responsible for for every single one of its readers thoughts because you know these this is millions and yep. millions of two billion users on facebook isn't it is it something like that unbelievable That's right, something like that yeah indeed but i mean i think this, this adds to the point i was making in a way which is that I, as you say they're in a very difficult position now and they what they've managed to do also at the moment in the united states which is what really matters being by far the world's largest media market apart from china uh, they've managed to annoy both sides of the political spectrum now and <laughs> i think that uh, what they're likely to face, therefore, is maybe an antitrust case, which would lead them certainly being ordered to sell Facebook. This is being ordered to sell WhatsApp um, and you know dis dismember themselves of certain other platforms, but also quite strict regulation. And the only real way, I think, to avoid some pretty costly consequences is to probably move much more to being a subscription-based model um, now. And 
you know, people say, oh, everyone's got used to getting stuff for free. Uh, I actually think that um, people would adjust to having to pay a, a subscription. Small amount. Services. Yeah, pretty quickly, I think. Yeah, but then again, do you not think like the kids, you know, if you've not got much money and you're like a student, I mean, it's the, it's the kids that make these things popular. Indeed. Yeah, indeed. But then I think um, there are... you you. The funding model for certain kinds of very stripped down services can be charged for at a very basic rate, which even somebody uh, with virtually no income can pay for. I mean, I imagine, for example, if WhatsApp was actually charging a fee, like an annual membership fee or something to use its service, it could get away with charging you something like about £10 a year and still make a significant amount of money out yeah. of it. Yeah. But why would the subscription thing improve things? Well, because it changes the incentives facing the company. Um, it means that, A, it, it makes their legal status much clearer um, because it means that they are basically like a newspaper, essentially, in a way. Uh, same kind of broad category of information service. And the other reason why it, it helps is because it changes the incentives. As I say, right now, um, there's a very powerful incentive to try and, A, get as large a group as possible, but also... Uh, essentially to find as much out about them as possible because that's your product you're flogging on their information to uh, other users to advertisers basically and that creates an incentive basically to actually quite deliberately create outrage angst lots of flame wars as they used to call them all this kind of stuff because all of that helps you gather more and more data about people and their preferences their likes and their dislikes which is what you're trying to do now if you have a subscription uh, model you don't have that incentive because there's no benefit to you in doing that to the extent that you annoy people have people in a state of you know irateness um it's just going to make them less likely to use your service so if you have a subscription model the incentive rather is to provide a good service you know like there isn't any other line of business um i mean there's nothing new in this in a way by the way because commercial advertising driven television has been driven by this model ever since it was first invented in the 1950s. And we've known for a long time what problems an advertising funded model brings in television, lowest common denominator programming, uh, things of that sort. Mm. And that's one of the reasons why much of the best television, in fact, I would say probably eight out of the 10 best television series of the last couple of decades have been made by companies like HBO, which again, have a subscription funded model. Yeah, yeah, they, they, they made so many great programs. Um, yeah, yeah it's, a, it's a very good observation. Do you, do you kind of, do you feel like it will be these companies that will survive? Because they've got so much money, you know, if someone comes along with a subscription-based social media network that starts doing quite well, right, well, let's just buy that as well. Ah, uh, that's, that's one problem. But um, I'm just going on the basis of history. It's very easy to think that because a company is in an overwhelmingly dominant position, mm. it's going to go on forever and maybe take over the planet. Now, I can remember back in the 19, early 1980s, everyone was panicking about IBM and how Big Blue was going to end up running the world because, you know, it basically made 90% of all of the computers on the planet. It was an incredibly dominant company with billions and billions of dollars in its cash, cash pile. Um, where is IBM now? Uh, you know, it, mm -hmm. it basically uh, collapsed as a computer company and it's, it became a management consultancy firm for a while. Uh, it's still there, but it hardly exists now. Certainly not the kind of huge, you know, global spanning colossus that it was. Uh, it's very easy to think when a, a company is at the top of a heap and totally dominant that it's going to stay that way forever. But actually, that very, very rarely happens. When it does happen, it usually means because the company has managed to get, use its money to buy political favours to make life difficult for new entrants and new competitors. That's the thing you need to worry about, really. Um, and of course, that's what may happen now. What Facebook and, and the others may do is go to the new majority in Congress and elsewhere and say, look, OK, we'll agree to be regulated. If you just take these regulations we suggest, which will just have the coincidental effect of entrenching us in the position we're in and making it hard for new entrants. Uh, that's the thing we really have to watch out for, I think. And do you have a good feeling about the intentions of uh, Jack Dorsey and Mark Zuckerberg and and the like. Uh, they don't strike me. I mean, I watched uh, Jack Dorsey on Joe Rogan. He seemed all right there. Mm. I mean, he does seem a bit weird. Um, but I, I think mean, a lot of them are. 
then again, I mean, the, the, the guy is has achieved so much. He's very intelligent. Um, you know, the, his detractors may describe him as a computer nerd. Uh, so these people don't tend to be hugely kind of charismatic um, in the <clears throat> traditional sense, but he seemed okay. Uh, um, Mark Zuckerberg, it, it doesn't get particularly kind treatment in the social network, but then again, that is a work of fiction. Um, so I don't know. Uh, it's very easy. You, you see a lot of abuse of these guys uh, on Twitter from people who are upset about Trump getting thrown off, but maybe they're good people. Maybe they're not. Who, who knows? knows? In, in Have a, a good feeling really about matter. it? I, I don't think it really matters, actually, in a, in a very real sense. Um, you know, you can have Mark Zuckerberg, evil genius, or, you know, Mark Zuckerberg, public spirited citizen, but actually yeah. I tend to think that it makes very little difference because what matters more is the institutional framework and the incentives that they're operating within. People mm -hmm. respond to incentives. It doesn't matter whether it's you or me or the CEO of a mega corporation. They still face incentives and they'll tend to respond to them. So if you aren't happy with what they're doing and the way they're behaving, what you have to do is change the incentives or allow the incentives to change. Uh, I think what their motives are really, uh, in a way, it's not unimportant, but it's not as important as that. Yeah, yeah, it's true. Um, the, the, and you mentioned, you know, it's important to not, not get too hung up with uh, companies being huge and you, you cited IBM. I mean, I guess MySpace weren't as big as this. I don't, what, what do you, do you yeah, know? Yeah, what what user mass MySpace got to before then? I don't know what percentage. It was certainly one of the, it was the big platform along with Facebook. It was a while when they were the big two. And similarly, there have been, you know, there's many other examples from history like this, you know, companies which are incredibly dominant. I mean, at one time, the big railroad companies, about nine or 10 major railroad firms, totally dominated the United States and had incredible political power. Well, you know, still around, but still very important companies big. actually but nothing how, like that power how do companies become like coca-cola and just yeah. you know never disappear is it government favors as, as you said yes indeed i mean partly because i don't even know but in the united states coca-cola is the democratic uh, company and pepsi are the republican one every time the um a party different party captures control of the white house or congress the soft drink machines switch from selling coca-cola to pepsi or back really but that's yeah. uh, well that's uh, interesting because uh, i read a funny piece in i can't remember what paper that was kind of taking the piss out of trump because he had this cozy lunch with some guy from the new york post and they said that he, they dined on trump's favorite cuisine hamburgers washed down with chateau de coca-cola uh, <laughs> yes, yeah, indeed. I mean, I, you could probably get that put in, but yes, it's 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 true. Some companies do survive for a long time, but actually, what is surprising is how few of them there are. Uh, what if you look at the companies that were in the top hundred in nineteen hundred, the number that have survived to today is amazingly small. The the, the right. turnover in terms of like membership of any of the big indices is is remarkable, really. That's really interesting. Um, I, I fear that we have spent uh, not enough time on music, although there is there is no such thing as not enough time or too much time because this podcast has always been free flowing. But as you presented me with a list of some of your favorite albums, I just wanted to, uh, you know, find out more about when you started listening to some of these bands um, to finish yeah, yeah. off the podcast. Uh, first of all, and, and you know, we, we won't have enough time to pick, um, to go through every single album. So I just want to cherry pick some of my favorites as well and just find out about your experiences listening to these things. Um, first of all, like Ride the Lightning by Metallica. Oh, great, great I album. Mean, yes, I know. Such a good album. When did you, did you, did you buy it when it came out? Or, I bought or... it when it came out um, on a recommendation. And th th that list of albums, it's not just my favorite ones. These are all albums which marked a new change in my you know, like listening habits. So until I, I listened to that album, I'd been a big fan of what you might call new wave of British heavy metal. So I was into Judas Priest and Tigers of Pantang and bands like that. Uh, but that was what really got me into more the kind of thrash metal um, as it was in the early part of Metallica. So it was that then led me on to uh, listening to a lot of Slayer and music like that, for example. So yeah, that was that was a key kind of moment for me. And I, I still think that's their best album, by the way. I think, you know, it's the the one i'd like most yeah maybe it's my favorite it has fade to black on it as well doesn't it it does fade yeah to black uh creeping death obviously the title track 
yeah bell tolls i mean yeah it probably is my favorite album yeah. it was, their, was it their second yes it was yeah unbelievable and then I mean, what, what was what was next master of puppets i can't remember i think so i mean i honestly they've made so many uh, albums i can't remember the order there, there was that run though i think it's ride the lightning master of puppets um and then uh and Justice for All, which has like one. That's right, yes, which is another very good, that's one of my favourites, yeah. And then the Black Album, and yeah. then it's kind of been downhill from there, more or less, with some good ones, some good Oh, albums. yeah, definitely, yeah. Um, and they're so good live, I think, anyway. Yes, absolutely, fantastic live band. I mean, it's a, uh, I mean, another one I've got on that list there, which is from that early period, is, is No Sleep Till Hammersmith, which... Um, I think it's one of the great live albums of all time. And uh, Motorhead were one of, the, one of the bands that I've always tried to see if I could see them live. Absolutely yeah. amazing live performances. Sadly, of course, Lemmy no longer with us, but... Have you seen the uh, documentary on Lemmy? Has there been? Oh, I definitely have to watch that. There is an awesome documentary on Lemmy. It's so good. Uh, he seemed like such a genuinely likeable person. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. And a huge proponent and supporter of female musicians, by the way, you know. Um, he gave Girl School, who are another of my favourite bands, a, a start in the music business, basically, because they they were a supporting act uh, with Motorhead on, on a tour. And he was a big supporter of getting, uh, had a huge campaign for years to get Wanda Jackson admitted to the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. She was... He she did. was in the country and Western Hall of Fame. And of course, she'd been this great rockabilly star with, you know, amazing records back in the early to mid 60s. And uh, Lemmy again was a huge fan and he had this kind of one man campaign to get her admitted to the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, which he succeeded. Yeah, he was an amazing bloke. Although it was a miracle he lived to the, as advanced an age as he did, quite frankly. <laughs> yeah, he, he that was one of the things in the documentary. You know, he wasn't sort of like self-congratulatory about his consumption of booze and fags and all the rest of it but he did just sort of say you know this is my way of life this is how i live this is and 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 you know in a way it's quite depressing in a way it's not i don't know he just that there's something he didn't try and make it they didn't try and make it seem more glamorous that, than it was you know mm. it's not like he was playing big arenas he was playing good good venues but they yeah. weren't like massive he just loved playing live yeah, yeah. it was his way of life and it's yeah, it, it, it was just awesome just yeah I'll definitely have to watch Philosophy. that. What's it, what's it called, the documentary? I think it's just called Lemmy. Oh, right. Okay. I'll definitely look it up then and, and watch that. Yeah, it's a big must. Um, you, and, and one of your, you know, top two favourite albums, you said, was um, ACDC Back in Black. Have you heard uh, yeah. their latest album? Yeah, I haven't heard it yet because I've, I've been sort of, the last few years, I've been more into this sort of dark ambient music, which is why I tend to listen to a lot at the moment but uh yeah i know they got another one out so i'll have to listen to it although i i, I do wonder about you know since malcolm young died what what they're they you know what, it's hard for a band to continue in a way when your key figure dies like that it's um mm, yeah i think they used an archive of his ideas or something to put it together is that so, right okay yeah. it sounds yeah. like it's going to be crap but i can tell you that it i thought it was really good and it sounded just like you'd want an ACDC album to sound, I think. I think Brian Johnson's vocals were great. Um, oh, he's fantastic. I mean, yeah, one of the greatest. I mean, although, I mean, I have to ask you this, the obvious question I ask you this, you know, do you, do you, is it Scott or Johnson that you think is better? It's like the Pele or Maradona? Um, or... I, I, I like uh, I like both. I, I love both, but I think Brian Johnson because, I don't know, it was weird. Like last year, I, I obviously I know most of their classics, but for some reason last year, it just suddenly struck me how good a song Thunderstruck was. I just came on shuffle on my iPhone. Mm -hmm. And I just, I was just like, this is actually an unbelievable work of like, art. And just as a vocal work of art, this is an, just such a good best vocal performance of all yeah. time in rock. In all, it, I don't know. I literally listened to it about a hundred times that day. <laughs> got me quite obsessed with him as a vocalist. Okay. Like, what a performance! Yes, indeed. Yeah, it was, and it's the thing of simplicity. I mean, with with, um, with that band ACDC, it's the combination of apparent simplicity and plain, this kind of stripped down mm. uh, kind of music, just these power chords but actually with quite a lot of complexity in terms of how the songs put together. And as you say, the, the whole performance, which is, uh, you know, such a, it's quite refreshing compared to the kind of elaborate song and dance stuff you can get with some other groups, which, you know, concealing not a lot of content really. Yeah. I, I mean, 
I, I just watched the Miles Davis biopic and I, and and you know I have a growing appreciation for jazz, but I have kind of you know chatted to to jazzers and 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 um, you know made music with jazzers and sometimes they love just kind of extending chords and and any kind of chord that doesn't have a 11th or 13th or something added to it they get kind of a bit they sort of think it's just too basic and yeah. i don't know sometimes the basic stuff can can yeah absolutely good. yeah I, I agree completely and and so you said your favorite artist and composer right now is joseph fargo who's joseph fargo well he's um a composer who produces music under the name of Knox Arcana. So he's in what you might call the dark ambient genre. And he's got a whole series of albums now. Uh, each album typically has a kind of overall thematic tone, but they're all kind of dark, goth, ambient music of one kind or another. Sometimes adaptations of classic tunes, more often his own his own composition and so on. He's he's put together a big composition album called compilation one actually called Ebenshire, uh, which is because that's a kind of fictional world that is the setting for a lot of his music. Uh, I find it very powerful, um, and it's um, it, it's a lot of electronic music, but also use of quite a wide range of instrumentation and things, and very cleverly put together in the studio, um, and. Very haunting if you're into kind of slightly surreal uh, and uh, horror influenced uh, theme thematic music then this is definitely something you'll like yeah i'm looking i'm looking forward to listen, listening to nox arcana um yeah, it's, it's, I've, quite, I've already uh, saved it's, it's something i discovered quite recently just a few years ago really um and uh, that and trailer music which is the other thing i've discovered lately so trailer music well hence two steps for, from hell and or that that uh, that's what it's known as it's sometimes called epic music but um a lot of it is actually music written for uh, film trailers trailers for you know movies and cinemas and so on so you've got a whole lot of com uh, joe blankenberg is one of the major composers in that genre uh, at the moment uh two steps from hell is one of the big production companies there's a number of others globus and uh immediate music people like that and um, is it always used in in those um, commercials or no, not at all? Um, so a lot of the composers they, they compose this stuff and just hope that some uh, production company will use it we'll use in it. a in a theme for a film or something like that. So there's a great composer. music in its own right. It is yes, exactly. There's a Finnish composer I like a lot called Antti Mark Marti Kainen, who um, he has about maybe a dozen albums now and. Most of it is stuff that he actually just composes straight off and then maybe he puts it out there on his website and maybe a production company or an advertising company will come and use it. A lot of it is for video games uh, and uh, MMOGs, which is another interest of mine. So um, I, I've just recently written an academic article about an MMOG called EVE Online. I don't know if you're familiar with it. But... No, I'm not. Oh, it's an amazing one. Where, where can I check out the article? Uh, it's coming out in a book from Cambridge University Press, which right. I can send you a copy of it. Um, awesome. it. It's an amazing, EVE Online is a kind of science fiction uh, style MMOG, which is set in a galaxy called New Eden. And it's, it's best known for these enormous wars and battles that take place. And a few years ago, there's one of them that took place, which cost about $300,000 of real money in terms of the value of the assets that were destroyed, uh, many of oh which were in, indirectly <laughs> paid for with real money. So <laughs> yeah, it cost, uh, it cost several trillion interstellar credits, which is the in-house money of that particular MMOG. So uh, it is extraordinary the amount of money uh, in gaming and the amount of money in, in actual games. Yes, precisely. It gets spent. It's, uh, Unbelievable. Phenomenal. Yeah, I know, and it's very interesting to an economist because there's, um, they actually have a, their own internal economic system. A lot of these games, World of Warcraft is another one like that. And mm. they're all, going back to music, a lot of these games, particularly the uh, science fiction shooter games and the fantasy ones, they use back, backing tracks, music uh, as part of the experience. And so they're a main, because they have all this money, they're a major market for composers of all kinds. Yeah. Yeah, and uh, well, I mean, in general, gaming and music, the intersection there is yeah. huge. I think Travis Scott appeared in Fortnite 
um, right, and yes. made millions off just that one appearance. So, you know, things are changing fast. Steve, thank you so much for coming on the Greatest Music My of pleasure. All Time podcast. It was an absolute pleasure to talk to you. It flew by to the extent where, uh, you know, we got onto the music too late, but I'd love to have you back on the show at some point in the future. And I'll Certainly let you know when, when this is out. Take Good care. Bye. Bye. If you're enjoying the Greatest Music of All Time podcast, you can keep up to date with all of our latest episodes for free by subscribing. If you're watching on YouTube, the subscribe button is located at the top of the Tom Cridlin YouTube page. It's also at the bottom right of any video that you watch on YouTube. If you're listening on an audio platform, such as Spotify or Apple Podcasts, you can subscribe at the top of the page.